for the day. Uh, we have two amazing speakers from Texas Rangers. We have Alexander, who is the assistant director of R&D. And with him, we have Oliver, data engineer from Texas Rangers. They are here to talk about how they revolutionized baseball analytics with Lake House. Over to you guys. All right, thank you. Uh, Mike's working. Are we on here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, we haven't even started yet. Already getting some applause. I know, so our title just rolls off the tongue. So maybe, maybe next year I'll come up with a shorter one. But we're going to hear talk about how baseball analytics has been revolutionized by using Databricks. And we are both on the operation side, so we both work on the money ball side. So there will be a lot of talk here about player acquisitions, the draft, all that good stuff. And we'll touch on some business aspects at the end, fan engagement, customer success stories. But we're mostly here to talk about baseball operations. Yeah. So yeah, quick introductions. My name's Alexander Booth. I'm the assistant director of R&D for the Texas Rangers. I've been with the club since 2018, so five years of consecutive losing records and a couple last places in the West. But, <laughs> but, 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 it was all planned. No, no, it wasn't all planned. Oh. But we were trying, during that time, we wanted to make sure that our data strategy was really good. And so over the last couple of years, we've been rebuilding our R&D department from the ground up. And of course, now that's all going to permeate with us being first place in the West this year. So very excited to talk about kind of that journey. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Oliver Dykstra. I'm a data engineer for the Texas Rangers. Uh, this is my first season, kind of first sports gig. Uh, it's been a joy. It's a great time to be in baseball. It's a great time to be in data. Uh, you know, huge thank you to the, uh, the convention center crew and, and Type A and everybody hosting us out here, Databricks. Uh, it's really great. Uh, just to get it out of, out of the way, yes, I, the family lore, I am distantly related to Lenny Dykstra. Whoa. Uh, and uh, I'm here to try to <laughs> re <laughs> renew the Dykstra name in, in baseball. baseball. There you go. Yeah. Um, excuse my voice. If uh, we were both kind of screaming at the Salt and Pepper concert yeah. last night, so uh, <laughs> we we're a little bit scratchy. You know, <laughs> we just pushed it. It was a little bit too, too, uh, we we were it too into good. it. Yeah, we did. We did. Anyway, here's a quick agenda. We're going to blast through this. I know we only got 40 minutes, so we'll kind of get as much as we can done here. Go into a brief background. What is like baseball analytics? Kind of where did it start? Uh, what is Moneyball? Hopefully, you'll kind of maybe have heard Moneyball, right? That left a big legacy far beyond baseball. And then we'll get into current land, land the current landscape. Baseball is a high-tech sport, so we're going to get into the big data that we have in baseball and how we use that to make personnel decisions. Um, then we'll talk about our, our original kind of data strategy to figure that out, basically, and then we'll go into our change into Databricks and why we kind of feel like we've built a future-resistant data strategy for the next few years. So we'll start with the beginning, brief history of baseball, or baseball statistics. Oh yeah, you're crushing the, the, the slider thing. Yeah, right? yeah there we go. Too, so, baseball, you. super old sport. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, first box score was actually printed out in a newspaper over 150 years ago. If I did my math right, 160 years ago? Anyway, a long, long time ago. Uh, this guy, Henry Chadwick, he's pretty famous. He's like wrote the first box score, and he also coined the term strikeouts. If you ever wonder why there's a K written, it's because of this guy who started kind of that trend. Uh, fast forward 100 years. Now we start to permeate these statistics even more in popular culture. There's board games, there's baseball cards. We all collected tops. I collected tops growing up. So having these statistics in popular culture is starting to revolutionize, getting that data available in the minds of people. Then the era of sabermetrics really starts to take off. In the 70s and 80s, we start having these statisticians thinking about the game in a new light. I can't do a presentation on baseball statistics without mentioning Bill James or John Thorne and Pete Palmer. Both of these guys revolutionized how baseball is analyzed, coming up with run expectancies, coming up with new statistics and metrics to evaluate the game. And it was only just a matter of time until these statistics started permeating into the front office. Then in, uh, what was it? The 70s, the 80s, uh, RetroSheet came on the scene. And these guys are super cool. You know, one guy's passion to make uh, baseball data available to everybody turned into this army of volunteers compiling play-by-play -play data, uh, going all the way back to 1871, all the way up to the current day. And uh, he open sourced it all. It's totally on retro. It's all, uh, open for everybody to, to grab and do what they want with out on RetroSheet. Uh, baseball Prospectus followed that up in the 90s. Uh, they were making magazines and setting them out. Uh, started very small, but they were getting into front offices, and they created some of these new uh, statistics like VORP and Pakoda. 
uh, that led to some of the modern statistics like war, and it really started to change the way that players we were evaluated in the front offices. So the reason why I bring up all this history is because one of our theses here, data availability leads to disruption. Moneyball didn't just happen in a vacuum. Moneyball was built on all of these statistics before it, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, all of these open data sources and the community built around baseball statistics. Uh, so Moneyball, Brad Pitt, Billy Bean, enough said, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 2001, 2003, the Moneyball A's, you're using data-driven insights to basically find market inefficiencies. How can we use the limited budget, the limited money we have to acquire players to make a good team that these other clubs may not be noticing? So the big inefficiency they identified on base percentage versus batting average. So this is a couple of correlation plots with runs scored. You score more runs, you win baseball games. So as we can see on the right, on base percentage correlates better to runs scored than batting average. So what you can do with that, you find guys in the market with low, low, I guess high, high on base percentages and maybe low batting averages. So they're undervalued in the market and then you just acquire them for their lower salary and then all of a sudden they're contributing more runs and you get a 20 game win streak, I think, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, this is a market inefficiency and I just went over this. So we'll keep going. The last kind of bit there though, Moneyball disrupted the entire industry of baseball, but of course it, didn't, it led an impact on the rest of finance, healthcare, this idea of thinking about data in a different way, using that data to make a decision, and then kind of disrupting the analytics, right? Yeah, and of course, they were doing this on spreadsheets, right? Yeah. And uh, okay. this, was, this was before big data. And so it's, uh, with the introduction of big data, we've got all these different technologies now that are tracking everything, right? Um, and it's changed the way baseball is played. Uh, it's the reason that uh, we were talking about, you know, all of a sudden you saw all of the defensive line moving over to one side of the field, um, which the MLB responded with uh, new rule changes. Yeah. Uh, so in 2015, StatCast came out. This is kind of the big name, right? If you watch a game, you'll, you'll hear them toss this around. Um, and uh, before that, pitch FX, and we started to really track the spin of the ball, the velocity, and getting some um, really cool information there. Uh, we switched some vendors around, MLB did, and, and settled on Hawkeye. This is a, another common technology in the sports world. They use it in tennis. They're starting to use it in uh, the NBA and stuff like that. That's and they're right. bringing in skeletal data and all of these other uh, really huge data sources. Um, you know, MLB says now they gather actually 25 million unique data points a game. Yeah. Um, and you know, with some of these outside, uh, there's skeletal stuff. We're getting 300 frames a second. Um, you know, for 300 pitches, what were we looking at? Like some. We'll show you what some of that actually looks yeah. like. So we're going to run through a few examples and show you a little bit of, of what we're looking at. Um, 12 cameras around the field, capturing, like I said, 300 frames a second. Um, you go to a game, you can you can find the cameras around. They're there. Yeah, they're pretty obvious actually. If you go look behind home plate, you'll see like a giant black box, and that's kind of one of the main cameras tracking the spin and tracking the players. Yeah, so these, these cameras allow us to generate three-dimensional models of the entire field and of the players themselves tracking every movement throughout the entire game. So we'll look at some of the basic stuff, and you know, this is this is getting. Let's it's always fun putting e videos in slide decks, right? So yeah. <laughs> no, no promises on how. This is some examples slides. of like immediate delivery, right? Live, uh, two, live two. statistics. Crushed on a line, forget about this one. So this is going to be the data that these uh, cameras are tracking. The so we're going to be tracking the, the exit velocity, the arc of that ball, and we're going to see some of these statistics come up. And these are happening on broadcast. Projected from run distance, exit velocity, that's being tracked from observed uh, captures of the baseball. And then we use these new statistics, exit velocity, to start interpreting and doing player evaluation. But then we can start doing higher level statistics as well. Uh, and this is great. Catch, catch probability. I mean, yeah, so this great. is like people ask, like, well, how do you use machine learning in baseball? How's that even come about? Well, we know where George Springer started. We know where this ball is probably going, and we can come up. We know how fast George Springer is too. So we can put all of that math together and say, all right, what is the jump he needs to get to be able to get that ball? What's the likelihood that he can do it versus other baseball players? And again, that allows us to make. And predictions and, and new ways to value players, right? Oh, this is a this is a crazy one. Yeah. This this Baez play is wild. I don't know if you remember this, but <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, so what you're actually looking at, though, this is act it looks like a video game, but it's not. This is actual live, not live, but this is actually captured data of all these players, even their motions of their legs and their diving in, right? So this is known as field vision, which is, and their paths, you can see exactly where they're going. This is all tracked from these StatCast systems. I looked under this because they look like little rag dolls as they start to run, and you know, the, some of the capture systems for the skeleton stuff was uh, a little bit dicey in terms of quality. But no, yeah, this play basically like they they really screwed up trying to tag him out, and he ends up like getting to like second base. <laughs> Whoops! I don't know. <laughs> Wild. Anyway, we're gonna actually like so that's kind of what data is being captured, and we'll talk about now kind of what does that actually look like at a more discrete level. So Kinetrax is, uh, is an outside data source then. Uh, MLB, we don't just get all our information from MLB, we've got outside data sources. Players are getting outside data sources as well. Uh, and this is markerless motion capture. Um, what, what were we figuring this out as? Uh, like we got 25 joints over 300 pitches, over 2,400 games. And they're raising it up, they're doing like 100 centers now for the 2023 season, which is... And so this is, this is really nice. great stuff, right? We can uh, attempt to uh, use this for injury prevention. We can look at stress on joints. Uh, we can also use it to find like inefficiencies in player motion, right? So it's, uh, the, the story is right at Little League, they tell you to open up your hips or take a bigger step to get out in front of the ball. We quantify that. I can tell you exactly how your hips look, how your elbow looks, how much force you're putting on your knee when you make a pitch. And then we can use that to make player personnel decisions. Is there someone on another club that maybe needs a change in their mechanics? And we can observe that, and then we can use predictive models to estimate, given that we change a motion in their mechanics or their elbow, what is the probability they're gonna throw more strikes? How does it increase their value to our team? And of course, probability of making the playoffs. This leads to all sorts of, well, I mean, a whole new range of things that we can look at, right? We can start to look at deception how long you keep the ball hidden. Even if it's just for milliseconds, you can really mess with the batter, right? You can, because right now the batters, they have, I mean, sharp eyes, sharp eyes. They can see the grip that the pitcher has, and if you can see the, the, the grip, say, okay, this guy's throwing a curve ball at me. They've got to tell. They can keep the ball hidden, so we can start to measure that. And then just, I know this is very, like, very baseball-y, right? It's not clear, I mean, this is a baseball like talk. But the idea here is that finding the next money ball, right? You wanna, f as you acquire more data, as new technology revolutionizes the space, whatever space it is, it could be finance, healthcare, stocks, whatever, right? There are new ways to think about evaluating that. So again, this is another one of our new data sources for this year. You may have seen it on the broadcast already, but every ballpark, this is, this is crazy, every ballpark is different, right? That's unique to baseball, across football, basketball, et cetera. So we can actually track the fluid dynamics inside of the base of the ballpark, and that's what this is doing. It's using the wind flow, and I'm like, I'm not a big physicist guy, so we have some very yeah. smart people on the team that can do some of this. So but we, what is the probability that a fly ball is going to be a home run or an out given the current wind patterns? And then how does that affect player personnel? Which baseball player is lucky by having the wind help most of their fly balls? And we play inside of a retractable roof, it's really hot in Texas, if you haven't heard of it lately. So we, that roof is closed a lot of the time. No wind. So if you take the wind out of the equation, how does that affect the true talent or the performance of that player? And how could that impact our roster? And these fluid dynamics go into hard sciences too, right? We, uh, Barton Smith is looking at you know, baseball aerodynamics. Uh, so this is a, yeah, this we is can act, the they're actually finding ways to get, uh, not just use uh, gyroscopic movement, right? But, how does the, uh, the stitching actually affect the way the ball moves? And so you're seeing people be able to get way more movement on their pitches. And then we build models off of that as well. If I hold my slider grip a little bit differently, if I expose more of my seams to the wind, to the air when I throw the ball, how much more movement is that going to get by causing that turbulence on the ball? I know, it's crazy, crazy stuff. <laughs> it hurts my head thinking about this. And you know, there's more and more coming online all the time. Uh, we're, we're still just scratching the surface here of, of what's presented and um, there's, there's more technology and, and information coming all the time. Um, of course, it's not just MLB. Uh, baseball is a worldwide pheno phenomenon now. The, the World Baseball Classic was this year uh, easily by far the most watched baseball game in all of history. You know? They're saying uh, in Japan something like 98% of households tuned into the final game. 
uh, and it's great. It's great drama. We've got, uh, you know, the, the Japanese leagues, Korean, there's European leagues popping up. Um, of course, you've got your Dominican Republic, your Mexican leagues, your Cuban. All, all great baseball, lots of traction. Um, and we're but, getting data from all of these guys. So our yeah. data isn't just at 30 MLB clubs. We'll, we'll get into some of the minor leagues. But we're getting tracking data. We're getting spin data from Japan, Korea, Mexico, Europe, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic. Baseball, there really is no off season. It happens even in the winter in some of these more hotter areas. And as technology gets cheaper, you're seeing this data collected more at not just the professional levels. You got your, your, uh, your minor leagues, but then also amateur leagues. We were talking to someone earlier today, he's like, hey, can you get this in my little league or what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's, it's, actually, it's, it's actually a thing. High schools and, college, and colleges now, they all have analytics and they all have tracking systems. Yeah. Five years ago, the tracking systems that we were talking about to track baseballs, super expensive. In the last two years, last 18 months, there's now super cheap options, Repsoto, Yakertech, and these are being deployed across the entire country. So now we're getting data on random high schools in the middle of Iowa, right? Yeah. And we're gonna talk about how that data can lead us to get a competitive advantage in things like the draft. It's not all sunshine and roses, though. It, uh, there's yeah. obstacles along the way. Yeah, too many things are taken for granted. And this is where hopefully it gets a little bit more relatable. So all the departments in baseball operations want to consume data. We have a mindset now of a data-driven organization, and they want to make decisions off of this data, these data sources. However, we are a very silo team, so I, I like this slide because when you think of a front office, you may not necessarily think about how it's actually broken down. But we have silo data teams, or we used to have silo data teams. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole group of people devoted to amateur analytics, looking at the high school and colleges, advanced scouting. We're playing the Tigers literally right now. So we have an advanced scale, like how are we gonna attack their pitcher? How are we gonna attack their batters, right, to get those outs? Player development, how do we get the players in our minor league system to be the best they possibly can be? Pro analytics, what are the contracts, free agents, who should we be targeting at the trade deadline? International analytics, we have a whole team devoted to looking at these players from Japan, Korea, Mexico. And then of course, underpinning that, we have some centralized teams. Our machine learning operations, data engineering, sports science, and baseball systems. All of these need to work together to communicate data to stakeholders. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, they're all using the same technology or anything, or the same tools and platforms. So, this, uh, I, 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 love, I love this story because it's so, relate it, it should be relatable. So our, our data journey is much like everyone else's. All of our stuff was on-prem. We had a ginormous SQL Server instance. We were putting all of our relational data in there, all of our spreadsheets, your hits, your outs, whatever you want. And unfortunately, that on-prem system, it, can, it struggles to scale when you start getting all of this big data sources coming our way. So after StatCast in 2015, 2016, we moved to a multi-cloud data warehouse, which we were hoping would be agile enough to adopt all these future technologies that we were trying, that we were hoping we would be able to ingest soon. So yeah, our first cloud solution, all-encompassing multi-cloud, um, that we kind of deployed around 2018, 2019, and it was built upon AWS on S and Amazon S3. And you know, we ran into all the, all the same old problems, right? Uh, data reliability, de uh, duplication, uh, limited support for advanced analytics and all that good stuff. Uh, but you know, while we never actually mired ourselves in the dreaded data swamp, we might have gotten <laughs> tangled in the data it underbrush was working on that at the very least. Like, how am I gonna drop data swamp in here? That's like, well, you may hear it again. Uh, so this is an example of one of our data products, right? <laughs> uh, step of one of the, part of the journey. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces, and it makes things so a little tough. All uh, the analysts care about is that, that one little rectangle at the far right. That's yeah. what they want to use for their semantic layer, their BI layers, and they have no idea all this mess happening kind of behind the scenes. But then you have a coach or a player, they say, you know, wh how'd you get this number? I mean, they don't, we, we have to earn their trust, right? We've got to explain ourselves and explain our reasoning. Oh, we called him to try follow to, the red line. Try to explain lines, this in the you know, elevator speech in the dugout. But anyway, uh, yeah, so this is kind of a, a common issue. Due to all the data duplication, the data replication, the hard transformations that we're doing, it wasn't a very agile system. If we wanted to add a new metric, a new KPI, we struggled to do that. We struggled to explain where things went wrong. Debugging that was a huge problem. Our, so I like, we have a couple other Ranger guys here. And like Eddie does a lot of the work, kind of like, hey man, go figure out what's wrong with it. Right? <laughs> it takes like a couple of hours. So time-consuming, expensive maintenance efforts, 
And of course, cost prohibitive proprietary formats and all of this redundant data duplications, the integrated storage and compute, we're doing all of our transformation layers inside of this modern cloud warehouse. And that ended up being super expensive, doing all that transformations there. So that, of course, led to inefficient and brittle layers. And what we really wanted, we wanted a flexible, we wanted a nimble data strategy to account for all of these new data sources. When we built this warehouse, we had no idea we were gonna get weather data, fluid dynamics, even skeleton data was still brand new at this point. So we were looking for kind of a modern strategy. Yeah, everything hurts when I'm dying. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're looking for a modern strategy to account for future resistant technology. Yeah. So I think I covered most of this. We yeah, had the pyramid of doom is what we called it. I think my last note here, uh, governance solutions. So our team is actually nationwide. We have analysts across all the minor league systems as well, and including the Dominican Republic. All these analysts need access to this data, and all of our data, data scientists need access to this data. And there's a huge bottleneck in kind of being able to say, hey, we built this new inference model. I want this KPI exposed. And it was just really difficult to get that incorporated. So we did want to make sure that governance was a solution. So we wanted kind of the following kind of tiers here. We want to eliminate all the expensive data replications. We want transparent data processes and nimble transformation layers. We want to be agile to acquire new data formats without these out of control costs. And we want to really, really steer away from proprietary systems and start investing more heavily in open source technologies. And of course, machine learning workloads. Our number of analysts has almost doubled over the last two years as we kind of were gearing into this window of contention. So there's more models being built than ever, and we want to make sure that they're able to put their technology in whatever kind of language they want and have it deployed for inference effectively. Action shot. We've got to pause here to uh, give a shout out to our senior director, Ryan Murray. Uh, if you can make yourself half a percent better, that's a win. It can be the difference between making the playoffs or not making the playoffs. Uh, smart guy, I gotta tell you. So a couple of our data tenets that we kind of wrote out, we want to provide an analytical ecosystem that scales as data sources are brought to market, provide choice in analytical technologies, our Python, SQL, AutoML, Tableau, also now Hugging Face, PyTorch, TensorFlow, ChatGPT, right, all the big ones. Uh, we want to empower our disparate data teams around the country with autonomy and agility in their insights and operations and avoid these bottlenecks of bringing data products to production quickly. And of course, we're a baseball team. You only succeed as a team. So let's eliminate these data silos, these siloed teams, and start collaborating more on models. We would have the same model built by different data teams, and then they would be making predictions on the same data. And you wouldn't know which one was the true source, the source of truth. Uh, this also has to start from the top down. The data-driven organization, it's a mindset, right? We want to build a organization that can sustain innovation and create actual insights to supercharge decision making. So we were lucky enough to talk with our GMs, our leadership teams, and say, hey, we really think that investing in a modern data strategy is the way to go. Transparency, availability, consistency. That's what we want to build a data culture within our R&D uh, staff. There's a really great profile on, on Bruce Bochy uh, uh, out recently. Uh, Check that out on The Athletic if you have access to that. But uh, uh, even, you know, Bochy, we, we had some, uh, some reservations at first, you know. He's, he's kind of an old school guy. But the guy's all in. He, he's a total scientist. He loves the data. And we'll talk about how like, the coaches kind of ask for this too. But we'll go quickly here through the next couple slides. Uh, the modern data community, producers and consumers, and this is where there's actually a lot of integration. A lot of producers actually also consume data. A lot of consumers of the data are also producing new KPIs and insights. And of course, data mesh, big buzzword, but something that we truly believe that we're trying to build and define in our own way inside of our data strategy. Um, I also call it like a data mesh supermarket or a data mart. So the idea here is you go into a supermarket, you know that you have vegetables, cereal, Chicken, <laughs> I don't know, frozen section, wine section. So the idea is that you go and you know, exact, you to, you know yeah. exactly where you need to go to get your product. So similar thing, if I want to go find all data regarding amateur, I should be able to log into my data warehouse, my data lake house, and say, hey, here it is. Or if I want to find all of our data sources regarding spin rate, including amateur data and pro data, I should be able to know on how to get that as well. So this is going to be able to define lineage and clear data documentation as well. So here's our little hub and spoke federation data mesh thing. So we have all of our data teams now being able to talk to each other. And if they want, they can access some of the other data. 
and that's all defined with governance inside of the Unity catalog, which we'll get to. And circling all of that, having that federated governance is stemming from the engineering team, the systems team regarding our applications, and our machine learning operations team to have some kind of centralized view on everything. All those obstacles, you know, of course, come great with any great challenge. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so it's that time of the that time of the presentation. Well, we skip over some of the you know, you're all right there, right? It was like two seconds. The lake house. Uh, yeah. It's a really big deal for us, right? To be able to get everything under one roof, uh, have all the best of all the worlds combined uh, instead of our kind of fractured pipelines and sad little silos. We can move forward to the collaboration mindset, the single combined platform. Oh, Databricks comes on the scene. Hey, well, hold your applause, hold your applause. I know, I know, it's really exciting stuff. Uh, we, uh, we almost put the, like, the little image of the house, you know, and that's like every, every presentation is going to have that one. You've got to find yeah. a, new, a new slide that says Databricks you, You've on. seen a, a few of these by now, I'm sure, but uh, we love Databricks. I mean, with its built-in scalability, flexibility, it's really strong governance and quality controls, but uh, with the backbone of collaboration built into it, uh, both and in its philosophy, but it's in its user experience, too. And How could we resist? Interestingly, we kind of came into Databricks more on the analytics side first. I wanted to get all of my analytics teams off of their local instances of RStudio, Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Clusters. Some of them weren't even using GitHub or CI CD. So get everything into notebooks, right? And then we can start kind of centralizing some of that, getting all these models registered. And of course, naturally, the data started flowing into it as well. And having the data where the analysts are has been a huge revolution for us in terms of our data team. So now we can have all these different sources flowing in the lake yeah. house. And people much smarter than me can uh, create actionable and compelling insights for the players and the coaches. And uh, we can get out on the other side with all these different um, insights through reports, uh, draft analysis, match uh, matchup reports, as he was talking about, and, and further machine well, learning. We'll share a few of those visualizations at the end, because they're pretty cool. Uh, Databricks recommended taking this uh, multi-layered approach to building a single source of truth. We uh, couldn't help but agree. Uh, it might su surprise you, but so you know, talking about retro sheets, they run into this problem when they're going back into old, old games. They, they're looking at newspaper clippings, and they say different things, you know. And we have the same problem. These different technologies and different stadiums, different calibrations. Uh, we can look at one pitch and get you know five different velocities and speeds, uh, not to mention different spin left, spin rates and all of this stuff. And yeah, that's really interesting to think about, because like if you see a baseball, you're like, okay, that went 95 miles an hour. But you have the radar guns, you have all these tracking systems measuring the speed and movement of that, and they all report different numbers. So how do you find this ground truth? How do you estimate? Again, we talked about some systems being cheaper than others. Guess what? That comes with a lack of accuracy. Yeah. So this data quality was another big problem that we wanted to fix. And having these medallion layers are actually a really good way to kind of understand, again, make those transformation flows much more transparent. That's right. So we can you know, get our raw stuff in the bronze. We have a full historical record. There's actually a, one of our, our uh, tracking sources um, had some failure, didn't have great backups, and they lost a lot of their stuff. We have our, our raw data. We could actually back them up. We did. They, had, they um, asked us for their, our own data, I guess. Yeah. To, it like, happens to everybody. It. It's, it's not a big Yeah, deal. sometimes you have a catastrophic data failure. So. Uh, then we can standardize and perform our rigorous, rigorous uh, quality checks on its way to silver. And we can work with data we trust, of course. And once we apply our own ag aggregations and modeling adjustments, we can reach a, a single source of truth in the gold layer so that our analysts can agree on uh, that sor source of truth in order to uh, work their magic. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we're going to go really quickly through this section, but there's a couple of engineering tools that we want to just give a big shout out to. So Unity Catalog, again, we have all these people across the entire country and the Dominican Republic, all these data teams. We do want to encourage collaboration, but we also want to make sure that's within a good scope of governance. So Unity Catalog, having those fine-grained uh, permissions has been huge for us. And we're actually, I don't know if we can actually say, but we're in the top secret private preview <laughs> of the AI in Unity Catalog, which has been great to kind of say, put those permissions around our machine learning registry as well. Oh, it was top secret. 
Uh, Photon, great. You should be using Photon. It goes everything super quick. <laughs> it's, it's great. Autoloader has been great as well. Uh, we just have kind of files that come in, and now we're able to ingest them almost continuously. Instead of having our batch jobs happen overnight, people want their data fast. As soon as the game is over, they want to sit down and look at their post-game report, understand where they failed, where they could get better, and we want to provide that. We want to allow that data to be coming in as quickly as we possibly can. Live tables, good way to transform that, get those pipelines going. I'm sure there's lots of talks about they oh, built the live tables. Know, you can't compare to all the announcements they're making around yeah. the live and of, tables. And of course, the data science workspace around this as well. Being able to have that unified machine learning engine where heavy users of Databricks auto ML. So it's been great to really have that all deployed in terms yeah, of explicit. Can't talk about that. Databricks without yeah. talking about their partner solutions, open source. Look at this guy. I'd like I to know, make him my partner. My tool. goodness. <laughs> Uh, yeah, from the beginning, you know, Baseball Analytics has been, has fostered a spirit of innovation and sharing very similar to the open source community. Uh, you could make the argument that they, they've been open source since the beginning. MLB makes all sorts of information available publicly. Uh, the, the fan generated content and analysis is huge. That's a great fit. Uh, we, we love open source. We really have tried to make a conscious decision to support open source whenever we can. Uh, the thing I would add to that list is, you know, there's the, the, the passion uh, for yeah. technology, for baseball. You know, there's not a lot of fields where you get people working, coming to conferences, and then spending extra time at night just, just, just digging, into the, digging into their domains. Yeah. And it's why we're all here, right? Um, the open source and, uh, uh, environment and uh, community is great. There's so many uh, benefits. I don't have to tell you about them. We, utilize, we literally utilize like every single one of these. Yeah. <laughs> so but I'm obsessed with it. Gotta, gotta give the major shout out to Airflow. Love that above all else, I gotta tell you. Uh, but you know, it's more flexible. The, the community support is second to none. Easier license management, no vendor lock. You've, you've heard all that stuff. Uh, of course, uh, we're baseballers. We understand that you gotta keep some stuff close to your chest to keep a competitive edge. Uh, these are some, uh, we're very, I uh, feel very fortunate to have found some partners to work with. Um, there's a few of them that have booths downstairs. You should go check them out. But that's also something that we didn't necessarily have kind of with these other kind of multi-cloud data warehouse systems and cloud-based things. There's so much innovation happening on top of Databricks. You all heard this at the Keystone, at the, the yeah, keynote this morning. That's right. So it's been great to have kind of that uh, ability to be innovative and kind of invest in startup technologies and try to be first to market. We feel that it's a competitive edge in baseball to be able to be investing in startups, investing in new open source technologies and having those rewards and being almost first to market with a few of these. If only five clubs are using some of these technologies and we're one of those five, then that's a competitive edge that we want to continue to maintain. So we're actively looking for new investments and new innovations. So the payoff, why we're here, right? It's like, uh, how can you not be romantic about baseball? We'll do a couple of quick explicit examples. Uh, this guy on the left, his name is Adolis Garcia. He's really, really good. Go vote for him for the All-Star game, I yeah. think, and closes at like This is the last new. day of voting. Yeah, so 2021, this guy was actually not very good. Big sad. Um, he was uh, traded from the Cardinals to us. We actually DFA'd him, and then we're like, all right, we'll give him a chance here. So looking at his mechanics, looking at his strategy, we told him to start lifting the ball more. We, on the right here, this is an actual like hit probability model, one of our machine learning models we have. Again, get on base, you win, get out, get out, you lose, right? So how can we use things like launch angle, that's the angle that the ball leaves the bat, to increase the probability of getting on base? And here you can see the red swoosh, that's a sweet spot, right? And it turns out that no matter how hard you hit the ball, if you hit it at an angle between around 20 and 35 degrees, it'll likely result in a hit. So we talked to Adolis, we had our coaches sit down with him. He's been working really hard over the last couple of off seasons. He was really good last year, he's even better this year. There was actually a tweet by one of our beat writers right before this that said, hey, look at his stat cast metrics over the last three years. There's been a huge change in expected batting average, expected WOBA, and it's partly due to the change in impact of his swing. So if we can give players you know, a way to improve and make themselves better, uh, it's better for everybody. Uh, but we make profiles on, you know, on people we're playing, uh, the pitch lineup, who's up next, and you know, there's just some 
You'll, you'll see so, in the broadcast. Yeah, next next time you watch the broadcast, keeping see, that information. Yeah, next time you watch the broadcast, see if you can see any of these things. So the guys are looking at their hats, they're looking at little cards, the catcher kind of looks at his wrist. There's data visualizations that we've created that are all here. So while they can't have live data for like reasons, uh, trash cans among them kind of coming in during that. <laughs> and I'd be remiss to do like if I didn't mention any trash cans in this talk. But we can provide printed documents before the game starts to kind of maintain that strategy, that advanced scouting solutions. And here's just a couple examples of these reports. So you can see that we have like these intense data visualizations, these scatter plots, these line charts, and all of our codes and players know exactly what they need from these, and they're able to use that to make kind of those decisions. Not necessarily in-game, because it's still a little bit of an isolated system when the game's happening, but right as the game begins and right after the game ends, we generate these pre- and post-game reports. And this isn't even touching things like player development plans, which will kind of go into a big payoff here, I guess. So yeah, we are using data in terms of our minor leagues, and this has been huge, right? We've gone to one of the best farm systems in baseball. That's our entire minor league system. Because of our data-driven decisions and player development, we're able to recommend that a certain player change their mechanics, change their pitch type, change their pitch grip, and that's resulted in better players on the farm. Further, we use data in the draft. Obviously, the dra or not, maybe not obviously, but the draft is in a couple of weeks here, and we have the fourth overall pick. So we want to really be heavily invested in who we select in the draft and make sure that they're going to provide us value a few years down the line. Unlike most sports, where the first round draft pick makes an immediate impact the next year, in baseball it takes three, four years to do that. And in that time you have uncertainty. So how can we use predictive algorithms, machine learning, advanced AI, to minimize that uncertainty when we make this decision? So the one name I'll call out on the last slide was a guy called Evan Carter. When he was drafted in 2020, nobody knew who he was. It was so funny. But we did. We had some data on him, like middle of nowhere, and we are like, this is a guy. This is a dude in scouting parlance. <laughs> and so when we drafted him, literally all the, call, all the talking heads on ESPN, they are like, who is this guy? They had no headshot. He wasn't on any top 100 list. And this guy is one of our top prospects now. He's a top five Texas Ranger prospect, and we expect him to be up in the big leagues in the next year or two. So a little, little cherry on top, uh, this is Josh Young. He's the uh, American League Rookie of the Month for both April and May. Uh, I mean, he's doing, doing an absolutely amazing thing. And so we have a little uh, speech from him. It was uh, American Baseball Coaches Convention back uh, this year in January. He's at the Rapsodo booth. Uh, and this is one of the technologies that players use quite often. Uh, exit velocity is a really cool thing, but I don't really focus on that a whole lot until like towards the end of the session after I get all my feel good stuff in. But I'm really looking at launch angle because um, without that, I mean, that's just a result of, to me, it's a result so of my thought process when I'm swinging up. when I'm in the box. It's not really anything more than that because you can, you can get lost in that really quick and people can literally start swinging up. But for me, I look at that just to make sure I'm within the right range. I think. Um, especially in professional baseball, they have a thing called barrel percentage, uh, and that's hitting the ball between 25 and 35 degrees. Uh, with the Rangers, we say 20 to 35 degrees is the perfect way you want to hit the baseball. So when, I'm trying to always when he said that, I would have gave me chills because I'm like, that's my model that said 20 to 35 degrees. It's, you know, it's glad to kind of get that kind of fine on the players. I think that's the biggest thing that the Rapsodo can do. with. I think that's the biggest thing you can wrap uh, Exit velocity is a really cool thing, but. I so a couple numbers, I mean, we've got to have some payoff big numbers here. So our team has doubled in size in the last 18 months, and we needed to make sure we had effective governance solutions around that, effective scalable solutions in terms of machine learning, getting rid of some of those uh, siloed machine learning workflows. Uh, the big one, the four times cost effectiveness. You know, so quick thing, if you ever work with budgets, you never ask for less money. So what I did, I took the same budget that I was getting in terms of my old kind of data warehousing architecture, and by putting all that into Databricks, we're seeing a four times increase in the amount of data we're able to bring in. We're basically not having to pay for the machine learning workloads on there too because of all the money we're saving in our transformation layers. So that's been huge. We weren't even able to bring in biomechanics data, some of the ball tracking data, some of the frame by frame player tracking data even into our warehouse, but we can in Databricks. So being able to make that data available leads to disruption. With leads to that increased velocity and communication of KPIs, we talked about how players want data fast. When players go to sleep, they forget about yesterday's game. They wake up, they're focused on today's game. Baseball is a marathon of a sport. So being able to increase that velocity and communication of what you did wrong, how we can make it better, and making those decisions fast has been a huge uh, improvement in terms of our data strategy. 
Also, yeah, hitting a home run with Databricks. I, I think I've had to say that cliche like five <laughs> times. <laughs> so funny. Anyway, yay, it's done. Big green check marks against all of our data tenants. And we feel like building our system on top of Databricks allows for all of these tenants and this future resistant technology to be a success. Mm. Uh, there's more to come. You know, we, we're only in the, the baseball operations side, but there's uh, a lot more going on around baseball. Uh, and, you know, again, breaking down silos. Uh, how can we start bringing this all together? Uh, looking at how, you know, when Adolis Garcia hits a home run, how does that drive social media and things like that? Yeah, there's a lot more uh, technology and big data happening on the, on the fan engagement side. And we'll kind of get touching on that maybe next year. We'll see if they invite us back. But anyway, where is Arlington going? 2024, we host the All-Star Game. 2026, we are one of the host cities for the FIFA World Cup, one of the biggest events in sports. And it's likely that maybe, maybe we'll have a semi-final game, maybe the final, you know, top secret. But anyway, there's gonna be millions of people coming to Arlington over the next couple of years. And we want to make sure that their destination is supported, that 360 view of the customer experience. A couple other baseball clubs already do this, but we have an investment in what we call the district. Kind of like Wrigleyville's got all those bars around it. If you've been to St. Louis, they've got uh, Ballpark Village. Atlanta's got a whole district around there too. We have that same thing. We have hotels, we have bars, something called Texas Live, but we also have 2023 XFL champions, Arlington Renegade. <laughs> <laughs> we also have some rugby teams, some soccer teams. There's lots of concerts that happen at our venues. We're having the Jonas Brothers in August, uh, which my wife is very excited about. Pink is coming, right? So how can we kind of use all of this data to kind of make an understanding of our customer and make Arlington a destination, not necessarily just for corporate engagements, but also for the public fan engagement as well. Data availability leads to disruption. Data availability leads to the Texas Rangers being first place in the West. Kind of an old screenshot, but we are still in first place. I double checked right before this. I'm like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we are. Uh, we have a five, what is it, Eddie? Six, we have a six game lead in the West, and we could only do that with the help of Databricks and our modern innovations. Yeah, thanks for so. your time. Really, uh, really happy to be here. <laughs> happy to be a part of the community. I, uh, I don't know. He'll tell you if we have enough time for questions, but we'll be hanging yeah, we're out happy to uh, stick outside here for as well. Minutes or so.